everyone and uh, sorry about the technical difficulties but i'm i'm back up in here and and very pleased to be here uh with our featured uh speaker today in our uh, biography series of arizona uh, biographies uh this is the second installment uh in the series so we're we're thrilled uh, to have scott with us uh here today um there we go uh just so you know i'm david turpey uh, I work at the Arizona Historical Society, where I serve as the Vice President of Publications and Communications, and I'll be the host today. Um, if you're not familiar with the Arizona Historical Society, let me tell you uh, just a little bit about it. Um, the Arizona Historical Society is a nonprofit educational and cultural institution and state agency established in 1864. AHS, AHS collects, preserves, and tells the stories of Arizona's past through museum exhibits, libraries and collections, outreach, educational programs, and publishing. AHS preserves our past, shares our state stories, and connects people through the power of Arizona history. Uh, and that last uh, line is, is pretty important because that's our mission statement, is we connect people through the power of Arizona's history. Um, if you want to stay connected with us, there's a number of, of different ways. Um, I particularly in, encourage you to um, consider becoming a member of the Arizona Historical Society. It's it's really not that expensive. It's $50 a year, um, and you get all sorts of great benefits, in, including copies of the Journal of Arizona History, which comes out four times a year. Um, other ways to stay connected, you can sign up for our email list and, and get information about us. We send um, an email out um, with a Quite a detailed email we send out about once a month about what we're doing and then occasionally send out other emails throughout the month so um, if you want to know what we're up to sign up uh, for our email list um, follow us on social media uh, facebook instagram the platform formerly known as twitter um, we're on a number of different platforms um, uh, i'd also encourage you to consider ordering a license plate uh, if you live here in arizona um, not only to support AHS, but it's a really, I think, a really beautiful uh, li license plate, uh, as you can see there. So um, please consider uh, staying connected with us. Uh, just a few reminders uh, here. Um, we have a number of ways to um, ask questions. There's a Q&A feature. Um, and I, as far as I know, the chat has also been uh, enabled, so you could you could enter a question in either the Q and A uh, section or the chat section. Uh, this event is being recorded, and it will go up on the AHS YouTube page in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if you want to watch it again and or or tell a friend about it, um, it'll be up on our YouTube page and it'll be uh, freely available. Uh, and we will also send a link to the recording to all of you who are attending um, today. All right, so without further ado, that's enough of me talking. Let's get to our featured speaker, Scott Einberger. Uh, Scott is an independent environmental historian and U.S. National Park Service interpretive park ranger. Born and raised in Napa, California, Scott has worked at parks in several states and currently spends his time between Northern California and Washington, D.C. His favorite national park is Guadalupe Mountains in West Texas, which Udall helped establish. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Scott now. All right, thank you. And uh, David, I think you have to um, give me back the screen sharing rights. Is that right? Okay, um, can you all give me a good in the chat if you can see the, just to confirm, you can see the full page um, 
PowerPoint slide there without my notes? No, nope, we see, yeah, we see your, your notes. Oh, you do. Okay, here, let's go. How that's, about that? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, hi there, and great to be with everyone for this virtual presentation. Um, thank you to the Arizona Historical Society for hosting me today, and particularly to Janie Adams for reaching out to me about this opportunity and coordinating the logistics. And thank you to David Turpy for the introduction. Um, I asked a few minutes ago, if you haven't done so, please type in the chat where you are um, watching from. Uh, I have always been fascinated with U.S. geography and maps, and I've driven across, across the country um, a dozen times, believe it or not, and lived in several states. And I was just curious where you all were watching from. I saw Hawaii, several places in Arizona, um, Illinois, but born and raised in Arizona. Um, that's great. Um, I haven't lived in Arizona, at least not yet, but I've traveled through Arizona on several occasions and uh, your state has a soft spot in my heart. You all have incredible landscapes and a rich indigenous heritage. And you Arizonans have also produced some significant individuals. Um, one of these individuals the nation lost recently in Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Another one of your Arizona significant individuals, uh, in my mind, is the subject of my talk today, uh, Stuart Udall. And you can see photos of him here with Presidents Kennedy Johnson and a, a later in life senior citizen Robert Frost. <clears throat> Udall was the best U.S. Secretary of the Interior this nation has ever had, and I intend to prove that to you today. Uh, more units of the National Park System were established under his 1961 to 1969 tenure um, as Interior Secretary than any other uh, Interior Secretary in history, and Udall was also a key player in major conservation and environmental legislation of the 60s, including but not limited to the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the National Wilderness Preservation System Act, and the Endangered Species Preservation Act. Whether talking about the need to combat global warming later in his life, or whether talking about creating the need to create new national parks and recreation areas, you'd all had an incredible ability, I think, uh, to see into the future and plan for the future today. And that's the reason for the title of my book, With Distance in His Eyes. He was not perfect, he was human, but he is one of my idols, and I'm delighted to share his story in my book with you today. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to take about 30-ish minutes or so to give you an overview of Stuart Udall's life and some of his accomplishments. And there will be time for questions, as David noted, so feel free to type your questions into the chat as we go. Um, and I will make sure I answer them at the end of the program uh, or as we go along, um, we'll see how that goes. So here we go, Stuart Udall. <clears throat> I didn't see any of you put in the chat that you're from St. John's, Arizona, um, but this is a photo of uh, St. John's, uh, kind of the east, northeast, central part of the state a uh, photo from today, and then a photo of a street and business of St. John's about 1931. This is a small town in the high desert of Eastern Arizona, roughly 50 miles south of Interstate 40 in the Navajo Nation, and just a few miles west of the border with New Mexico. Stewart was born here in St. John's in 1920, and it's also where he was raised. Um, he was raised in a deeply Mormon household. Stewart's grandfather, David King Udall, whom Stewart knew well during the first couple of decades of his life. Uh, but David King Udall was the stake president in this part of Arizona, a higher position in the Mormon church hierarchy. Udall's father, Levi, practiced law and his mother, Louise, while she served the large family in the more traditional housewife role, she also wrote a wonderful little book late in her life about her friend, Helen Sequaptua, a Hopi Indian. 
Beginning in his 40s as Interior Secretary, Stewart was a prolific writer, and he wrote that growing up in St. John's made him a conservationist. The land made me a conservationist. Water was used conservatively, and it was not wasted because the land was arid and there was little water to be taken in the first place. Manure from farm animals, Udall wrote, was used to fertilize crops and family vegetable gardens. Our parsimonious land put a premium on wise stewardship, so naturally recycling and stretching was a way of life, Udall wrote. Udall was an avid reader from early on in his life, and he also hunted, fished, hiked, and horseback rode through the local landscapes and mountains in and around St. John's. After his Mormon missionary work in New York, and after serving in combat as a fighter pilot over the skies of Europe during World War II, Stewart attended the University of Arizona in Tucson where he served as a star point guard on the basketball team. You can see a photo of him uh, dribbling there. Completing law school, he then opened up a law practice with Morris, his younger brother. And a lot of you from Tucson and in general will know the name Morris Udall as well. Uh, during this time in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, Udall met and married Irma Lee Webb, or Lee Webb, shown here in the picture with Stuart and Robert Frost. And Lee and Stuart remained faithfully married to each other for over half a century until Lee's death in 2001 at the age of 79. Um, Udall, oh, excuse me here. Also in this time period, um, the Udall name was becoming big in um, Arizona. Stewart's father became Supreme Court Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court, um, and a, another family member became mayor of Tucson. The Udall family is a big name in itself. Um, Udall, Stewart's son, shown here, uh, Tom, was born in this time. Uh, Lee and Stuart had six kids. And this is a photo of me with Tom Udall. Uh, Tom priorly served as Attorney General of New Mexico, U.S. Representative from New Mexico, and a U.S. Senator. Um, and he is currently an ambassador. And getting to meet Tom in his plush Senate office building here and handing him a copy of my biography of his son was a fun experience. Uh, not every day that I get to meet with a U.S. Senator and set of my idol, so I'm showing off that experience to you here. Um, but Mormons are known for large families, and the Udall family was and is a big name in the Southwest. And uh, because of this, uh, in the early 1950s, uh, Udall was able to um, in somewhat stand on the shoulder of his uh, family members and get elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. He served three terms in the lower house and Udall was placed on the Interior and Insular Affairs Committee, including all of its subcommittees. You all know that Arizona has lots of indigenous land or Indian reservations, and that's the salmon color or pinkish color here on this federal lands map. Um, the Navajo Nation, um, that northeast corner of Arizona. Um, the light green on this map, which is a little hard to see as there are hundreds of small park sites, but that's the national park system, the light green. And if you look closely, you can see the hot light green of Grand Canyon National Park in the northwest corner of uh, Arizona. The darker green is the national forest system which is not managed by the Department of the Interior, but rather by the Department of Agriculture. Um, and so that was not an interior committee assignment, but rather agriculture. But the yellowish color is Bureau of Land Management lands and think wide open high desert and plains landscapes. The BLM is the largest landholder of any federal agency and it is part of the Interior Department. Finally, there's the Browns of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Like the National Park System, a little bit hard to see on this map, but hundreds of national wildlife refuges. Udall's work on the Interior Committee in Congress helped him learn about all, all about the Department of the Interior, and it served as a good precursor to his becoming the cabinet member in charge of the department. 
One thing Udall did during his three terms or six years in Congress was align himself with a young, very wealthy, handsome, and charismatic politician named, <laughs> you all know it, uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. During the presidential election of 1960, during the primaries, Udall actually helped swing Arizona in favor of Kennedy rather than Lyndon Johnson. Arizona's electoral college voted for Nixon in the general election, but the nation as a whole selected Kennedy for president. Kennedy then began work on establishing his cabinet. Udall was a Westerner, the West being where most of the Interior Department lands are, are located. Kennedy liked that Udall was a Westerner. Kennedy also appreciated Udall's support during the campaign. And finally, the two were pretty aligned politically, both being literals, liberals, excuse me. Due to these factors, Kennedy asked Stewart to be his interior secretary. Stewart's ship had arrived. Udall was not only Kennedy's first cabinet selection, but at age 40, he was its youngest and most athletic and healthy cabinet member. This is a graphic I discovered of Kennedy's cabinet, and you can see Udall at top right. Stewart would serve as interior secretary through Kennedy's assassination and for the duration of the LBJ administration, making himself one of only three cabinet members to serve the entire eight years uh, it, it, of the JFK LBJ tenure. Robert McNamara, uh, top left, secretary of defense was another eight year although he became more and more controversial as the country escalated its presence in warfare within Vietnam. Orville Freeman, bottom left, Secretary of Agriculture, also remained for the entirety of the Kennedy-Johnson tenure. <clears throat> Udall, it's worth noting, served eight years. Serving eight years is tied for the second longest stint as Interior Secretary in history. Bruce Babbitt, um, former Arizona governor, served the entirety of President Clinton's two terms. And then the longest serving interior secretary was Harold Ickes, um, a man that did some good, but that was also extremely controversial. Ickes served the entirety of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's three plus terms in office from 1933 until being fired by Harry Truman in 1946. So Stuart Udall, a progressive Mormon from rural Arizona, is Interior Secretary in 1961, serving not just Arizona, but now the entire nation, as well as the President of the United States. Again, showing this map, he oversees the National Park System and its National Park System, the light green, the National Wildlife Refuge System and its U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the brown, he oversees the Bureau of Land Management and its wide swath of public lands. And it's worth noting that the BLM to this day controls and manages all federal land mineral rights, including oil leasing. That's the yellow on the map. He oversees the powerful and politically connected Bureau of Reclamation, the massive water infrastructure agency managing and creating dams, reservoirs, canals, and hydropower plants throughout the Western US. Finally, he oversees the Bureau of Indian Affairs and most of the energy-related agencies of the federal government at the time. The U.S. Department of Energy was a construct of the late 1970s, and as such, interior secretaries prior were the de facto energy secretaries. I'm going to share a few of his myriad accomplishments at Interior, but before I do that, I want to provide context uh, for the time of this post-World War II America. So context of the time. This is the world, world Udall inherits as Interior Secretary, a 1950s and 60s booming economy where people are buying houses with big front and backyards shown here and buying cars like never before. It's generally a very prosperous America. Many parts of Europe and Japan were destroyed in World War II, but not so on the U.S. mainland. The U.S. had a leg up on the world competition because we didn't have to rebuild. Inside homes, families are enjoying televisions and new gadgets such as washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, air conditioners, and so on. Millions upon millions of Americans are benefiting from this increasing prosperity at mid-century. 
But the rising affluence led to rising effluent, an increase in air and water pollution and a reduction of natural habitat due to increasing amounts of pavement, parking lots, highways, and houses. Post-World War II, America witnessed the grand rise of suburbia. These mid-century photos show traffic, and we know that more vehicles on the road lead to more toxic fumes, including carbon dioxide, um, emitted into our communal air and atmosphere. Another photo here from mid-century shows pesticides being sprayed on crops from a plane. Pesticide use resulting in polluted soil and waterways. The bottom photo shows abandoned tires trashed on the Chesapeake Bay shoreline in Baltimore. America today stands poised on a, let me start that again. America today stands poised on a pinnacle of wealth and power, yet we live in a land of vanishing beauty, of increasing ugliness, of shrinking open space, and an overall environment that is diminished daily by pollution and noise and blight, wrote Stuart Goodall in his first book. This, in brief, is the quiet conservation crisis of the 1960s. So how did Udall tackle some of these problems as Interior Secretary, these pollution and less open space problems? Well, for starters, he helped establish more national park units than any other Interior Secretary in history. Udall saw establishing national parks as a, both a means to conserve land, water, and wildlife and he also saw it as a way to improve the lives of Americans by providing healthy outdoor recreation in the great outdoors. Hiking, camping, fishing, and so on. This is a map I created of all the national park units established under Udall's watch. About 61 park sites added to the national park system. This tack map took me about three hours to create last week because, well, there's a lot of parks. <laughs> Um, but I have a quick activity I thought uh, I would like to have you all do, please. Um, if you could take a moment and scan the map and count how many of these national park sites you have been to, um, and then write that number in the, in the chat. So go ahead and take a moment, please, and do that now. And look at these parks and count how many you've been to and put that number in the chat, please. I do want to note that some of these parks created in the 60s were named differently back then, um, but I have the park's most current nomenclature here. Okay. Well, neat. Um, cool. So some of you have been to quite a few places of here, of these. In a lot of instances, um, Udall visited proposed national park sites with an entourage of reporters. Let me switch that. I don't want you to see my notes here. Uh, in a lot of instances, Udall visited national park sites with an entourage of reporters and elected officials. And since a lot of these places protected spectacular landscapes or important pieces of national history, uh, the enthusiastic support of specific parks created enthusiastic um, interest in them. I want to touch on three specific parks that Udall helped create. First off is perhaps my most favorite unit in the entire national park system, uh, Western Texas's uh, Guadalupe Mountains National Park. And these personal photos of mine don't even do it justice, um, but I love the U.S. Southwest. Uh, it, it's vast and rugged landscapes, it's sky island ecosystems, and Guadalupe Mountains contains all these. Guadalupe Mountains is also a wilderness park, or what I call a wilderness park. And what I mean by that is to really see it, you have to do strenuous hikes, climbing two to 3,000 feet in elevation up into the mountain core. Um, a highway only skirts the park and there is no road through it. So you really have to do day hike or overnight backpacks to, to see the, the, the beauty of it. 
The Guadalupe Mountains were all private land until Udall became Interior Secretary. He then learned that an oil geologist and conservationist named Wallace Pratt, who owned several thousand acres in the McKittrick Canyon area, wanted to donate his land to the National Park Service. The cause of conservation needs a new generation of outdoor philanthropists, Udall pleaded in a 1961 newspaper article, and one philanthropist that came through was this Wallace Pratt. And an even bigger landowner, the Hunter family, owned even more property in the mountains and grazed their stock in the high country. The Hunter family was selling their property. Here's a photo of Lee and Stewart and a National Park Service ranger. Udall drummed up interest in the proposed Guadalupe Mountains National Park by taking a boots on the ground and helicopter tour of the area with the media and po politician entourage. My mouth is still partway open is what he said after seeing the area and then touching back down in El Paso for a conf press conference. I expected something spectacular, but this exceeds my expectations. With canyons that deep in the escarpment, the area will certainly make a good addition to the national park system if Congress approves it. Congress did approve it, in part because of the means of purchasing the parkland involving the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which I can talk about in a few moments. Congress passed a bill for the park and LBJ signed it into law on October 5th, 1966. A few years later, Guadalupe Mountains National Park officially opened to the public. Now, uh, a second example of Udall's uh, helping to create national park units. This one's much closer to home for a lot of you. Uh, Saguaro National Park, a two unit park located just west and east of Tucson. Um, I'm sure many of you have, have hiked or driven through it. Saguaro was a national monument and only consisted of the Eastern section until Udall stepped in and got President Kennedy to use his pen. The lands that now consist of Saguaro National Park West or the Tucson Mountain District was Bureau of Land Management lands in the early 1960s. And when Udall was still a Congressman, the BLM without any notice, opened up several thousand acres of land right there for open pit mining. Being so close to Tucson and threatening to mar the beauty of desert views, the BLM's decision created a local public outcry. Mining was okay, but do it farther away from the city was the general consensus. Udall heeded this consensus and soon after he became interior secretary, he got Kennedy to utilize the powers of the Antiquities Act to create the Tucson Mountain District of Saguaro National Monument. The legislation outlawed further mining. This is a more recent photo of Saguaro National Park, Tucson Mountain District. And you can see here the spiral petroglyph there from the prehistoric indigenous inhabitants. Um, as, as the naming of the park suggests, this national park protects the most iconic species of the American desert, perhaps. Um, the saguaro cactus. Okay, so I've told you I'd spotlight three examples of Udall's help establishing new parks. I've mentioned Guadalupe Mountains in West Texas and Saguaro West in Tucson. Thirdly, I am taking you to the place I currently work uh, and am sitting at, um, Whiskey Town National Recreation Area, located in Northern California, about three hours north of Sacramento. Excuse me. This is a picture I snapped last winter of Whiskey Town Lake and one of the buoy lines here with Shasta Bali, uh, the highest mountain in the park, in the background showing its winter wide. And this is pretty accurate for actually my view today. Uh, pretty cloudy and cold out there and snow elevation is, is pretty low right now. Um, the lake itself is about 1,200 feet in elevation. But introducing you to Whiskey Town is a good way to introduce you to Udall's involvement in not only parks establishment, but reclamation or dam and reservoir building in addition to park creation. For the 1960s was generally the final decade and peak decade of the federal government creating massive water infrastructure projects to support downstream farms and municipalities. This is a 1963 photo of Udall, Kennedy, and other politicians, as well as Secret Service agents walking across the crest of Whiskeytown Dam. Here's another one of Kennedy 
with his interior secretary seated behind him, dedicating the dam as the final component of the Bureau of Reclamation's Central Valley Project. Traditionally, the American conservation movement included both land conservation as well as reclamation. But in the 50s and 60s, Sierra Club's David Brower began speaking out against dams very publicly. And Brower and Udall had a good working relationship, but he undoubtedly embarrassed uh, and made Udall upset on occasion. Dam building was politically very popular, and Udall himself played a major role in pushing through the Central Arizona Project, a reclamation, a rec excuse me, a reclamation project which effectively created modern day Phoenix and Tucson because it brought massive additional water from the Colorado River to your localities. But dam building became more controversial during this era as the conservation movement morphed into the modern environmental movement. And environmentalists, or some environmentalists, began to advocate more vocally for the rights of native, native fish and natural river ecosystems. Udall was kind of caught in the crossfire of the dam dilemma. And for better or worse, he supported both. He supported and pushed for dams in many cases, but lobbied as well for wild rivers in other cases. And he was actually one of the primary cheerleaders and champions of the 1968 Wild and Scenic River System Act. I do want to note though that this support for dams and particularly one very controversial one Morris's tenure as interior secretary in some people's minds. Of course, many Bureau of Reclamation dams are also hydropower dams and a non-polluting form of renewable energy, which I think is an important consideration to ponder. At any rate, Udall and Kennedy dedicated Whiskeytown Dam in 1963. And then a couple of years later, the Whiskeytown National Recreation Area was officially established within the national park system. I wanna pause here for a quick moment to see if I can answer any questions. Um, please feel free to put them in the chat. David, if you wanted to call them at to me, out to me if they do come in. I know I'm covering a lot in a little amount of time. Um, I'll also give you my email at the end of the presentation if you want to have some questions for me, uh, if you had some questions for me uh, in private. Um, but I wanted to give you all the opportunity to, to ask questions. I know we're covering a lot. Okay, no. we'll also be able to answer questions at the end. Um, I wanted to touch upon one other major success of Udall's. I could spend a lot of more time talking about his successes as Interior Secretary, but one other major success was in wildlife conservation, particularly with endangered species. These are two of my personal photos, the bald eagle sitting above Whiskeytown Lake. And then in 2010, when I was a ranger at Denali National Park in Alaska, um, a family of grizzly bears on the main park road. It might be hard to imagine because these two species have recovered remarkably in recent decades, but both the bald eagle and grizzly bear had dangerously low population levels in the 19, by the 1960s. There was a danger of both species becoming extinct. Many other wildlife species, large and small, were in danger of becoming extinct. But Udall, as Interior Secretary, put substantial actions in place to turn the tide. Rachel Carson had been a writer for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, in fact, a Department of the Interior employee herself, before she broke out and wrote books full time. And this is her most famous book, which came out in the early 1960s. Silent Spring was not fully against the use of pesticides, but it did recommend using much less of it. For Carson, worried about a future spring where no life could be found, no fish, no insects, no birds that feed on the fish due to the widespread use of pesticides. And she particularly raised the alarm in the early 1960s about DDT. She took major heat from pesticide companies and their lobbyists for her stance. Who was the Kennedy administration official that quickly and publicly came out in support of Carson? Who was the Kennedy administration official that quickly and publicly uh, banned the use of DDT on all of the lands managed by his department? <laughs> Stuart Udall. Uh, Udall was a lifelong intellectual and Carson met with Udall and Robert Kennedy 
at Udall's home one night to discuss Silent Spring and the issues of pesticides. Rachel Carson had cancer and was in declining health all through this time of her popular book and controversial book. And Udall was even the pallbearer at her funeral. But yes, Udall came out big time in favor of Carson and in favor of reducing pesticide use. The reduction of DDT, the reduction set in place in the 1960s and 70s, substantially helped bring back the bald eagle from the brink of extinction. Um, there were less than 500 nest breeding pairs in the 1960s. Now there are more than 50,000 nationwide, including here at Whiskey Town. This photo is a little bit hard to see, but it is the official 1967 endangered species list uh, of the United States. The Endangered Species Preservation Act uh, passed by the Bipartisan Congress and signed by LBJ into law in 1966 authorized the US Secretary of the Interior to come up with an official list of endangered animal species. The act also authorized additional funds for these species, particularly via purchasing land for them and adding it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Wildlife Refuge System to give them additional land. A simplified version of the modern environmental movement notes that the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973 when President Nixon was in office and Udall's friend, Rogers Morton, was Interior Secretary. The 1973 act was bolder than this 1966 act, but the 1966 Act, referred to by some as the Udall Bill, was the precursor. And um, that was certainly a success as well. Okay, so I've covered a national park system expansion as well as Udall's success in wildlife protection. Um, Again, I could mention a lot more of his successes, but um, you'll have to buy the book to, or ask me questions in the, in the chat at the end for me to cover that. But I want to mention a few reasons as to why Stuart Udall had so much success um, as Interior Secretary in the 1960s. One big reason is that there was broad public interest in conservation, outdoor recreation, and environmentalism. Lots of citizens and nonprofit organizations focused on these things. And this led to conservation and outdoor recreation legislation being very bipartisan. Both houses of Congress and the presidency were controlled by Democrats in the 1960s, but Republicans in everywhere were big players in the conservation and environmental movements as well. These two photos uh, show, um, at left, uh, they show Thomas Kuechel, K-U-C-H-E-L, but pronounced Kuechel, the senior U.S. Senator of California in the 1960s and a moderate Republican. He was on the Interior Committee and helped push through the Udall, helped push through with Udall and others, the Redwood National Park Act, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and the Wilderness Act, among other things. The other photo here of the gentleman with white hair, that's Rogers Morton, who I've actually done a lot of research on for a forthcoming book. Um, he was a Maryland politician, was a member of the Grand Old Party that pushed for conservation bills, and Morton served successfully as Nixon's Interior Secretary from 71 to 75. Another reason Udall succeeded as Interior Secretary is because he was okay with compromise. I found this graphic online and love it. Uh, for to me, it symbolizes the two people talking about something from different perspectives, the circle showing what they have in the common, and then moving forward with that commonality. Insisting upon a purist, all or nothing position on complex issues can only dilute our influence, Udall wrote. The resulting inaction will mean lost opportunities in a period of last chances. So Udall was okay and uh, was big with uh, compromise. And I think that's um, something important for all of us to note in this day and age of uh, extreme politics. A third reason, though not final reason, why Udall succeeded as Interior Secretary 
was because of his speaking and writing, um, he was an extremely eloquent and well-spoken writer and speaker, in my opinion. These are his two first books. He wrote several more later in his life, but The Quiet Crisis came out in 1963 and was really one of the first um, American environmental history books, a book that talked about how Americans have shaped the land and used the land and how the land has uh, shaped Americans. Um, his book, uh, 1976, Agenda for Tomorrow, which was published in 1968, um, talked about uh, the society America could and should go into during its third century beginning in 1976, 200 years after the country's founding. Um, this 1968 book uh, even mentioned the war, sounded the alarm on global warming, but it wrote about um, things like the importance of the use of wide scale solar energy and urban uh, mass transit. Okay, that's a little bit on Interior Secretary Stuart Udall, but in 1969, he hadn't even, he, he was just turning 50 years old, but the Democratic LBJ administration leaving and with the Republican Nixon administration coming in, the Arizonan was out of a job. So what did Udall do as after his years as Interior Secretary? Well, he began writing even more. He was a regular writer for Newsweek for a few years in the early 1970s his column entitled Udall on the Environment. He also continued to write several books, as you can see in this photo. In the late 70s, Lee and Stewart moved from the national capital area back to the Southwest, where Stewart opened up a law practice like he had done 30 years prior. He became very involved in a series of lawsuits defending Navajo uranium miners, as well as Navajo and other downwinders. These individuals had been mining in unventilated uranium mines in the 40s and 50s to help produce the atomic bomb, but had not been given proper safety within the mines. A couple of decades later, these uranium miners were dying from cancer at unprecedented rates. With many of them poor and impoverished indigenous people and Caucasians, Udall led these lawsuits pro bono. The lawsuits took a personal toll on Udall and were mentally challenging to say the least, but the former interior secretary did help get the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act passed in 1990. And to date, about 30,000 families of victims have been compensated from 50 to 100,000 by Uncle Sam. Another thing Udall did after his interior secretary years was um, another trail he took involved vocalizing the need for the country to combat global warming climate change. In the 1980s, he even helped facilitate bipartisan conferences on how to move forward on environmental protection and global warming legislation with none other than Robert Redford. You can read the quote here um, about his warning about global warming. Udall eventually moved to Santa Fe, where during his twilight years, he was involved with lots of hiking, taking in and enjoying the views of the area, and serving on the board of several nonprofits. Not long before his death in 2010, at the age of 90, Udall wrote a letter to his grandchildren. It was a public letter, and the grandchildren were not only his own grandchildren, but effectively anyone younger than him. The last two sentences read, go well, do well, my three sentences, go well, do well, my children, support in it all endeavors that promise a better life for the inhabitants of our planet, cherish sunsets, wild creations, and wild places, have a love affair with the wonder and beauty of the earth. Thank you all so much for your interest in Stuart Udall and the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, I enjoyed chatting with you about Udall and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if you would like to purchase the book, um, the 
Arizona Historical Society has a few copies in their museum bookstore. And you can also email me at this address. Remember the um, underscore there. Um, I'm on PayPal. I can sign your book and send it to you if you are interested. Um, but again, thank you so much uh, for your interest. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. I will stop sharing the screen there. Yeah, thank you, Scott. That was that was great. Um, and I, yeah, I hope people order your your book. Uh, we always want want people to read Arizona history, and um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. And we don't have any questions in the in the chat at the moment. If anybody has questions for Scott, please go ahead and and put those uh, in the chat or the Q and A. Uh, we do have a few. Uh, comments that I thought maybe I would just share with you. Um, uh, one of our audience members, Roberto, said that he served as Stuart Udall's secretary during his entire service as congressman uh, from Arizona. So wow. very, uh, very cool. Um, uh, we had um, someone else say thank you for presenting on Stuart Udall. Um, and then I saw uh, somebody else commented, Stuart's brother Burr still practices law in Tucson. Uh, and then we had a comment about a, a, an animal that um, has, has made a comeback due to Stuart Udall, a, uh, a goose, a nene goose. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, in Yeah, Toronto, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, that's, that's fantastic to see that his, his legacy uh, still lives on today. Um, okay, so we do have, uh, we're getting some questions. All right, so do you have any comments on the current state of interior leadership, Department of Inter the Interior Leadership? First off, um, can you, my screen, I'm, what I'm seeing is a little bit weird. Can you see me and um, I, without my, my uh, PowerPoint, right? You can just see me? I just, yeah, I just see you and then, and then me. Okay. Um, great. What, um, can you read me that, that first question one more time? Sure. Yeah. Do you have any comments on the current state of the Department of the Interior leadership? Sure. Um, I, uh, I have studied, uh, a lot of interior secretaries, um, both Republican and Democrat. Um, and, um, I will say speaking as an author, uh, from this book, um, what I see from the outside, um, I think it's, I think it's a really cool and awesome thing that both the director of the National Park Service and um, Deb Holland, our current interior secretary, is um, is indigenous. Frankly, I don't care um, which party that were to come from. I think it's uh, a great um, ball forward for U.S. history. All right. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, all right. Next question. Did Mo Udall share his brother's interests? Good question. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Morris Udall, uh, Morris, uh, once Stewart became Interior Secretary uh, and left his congressional seat, Morris uh, took it and actually occupied it for the next 30 years. And Morris Udall himself was a big time conservationist and environmentalist politician. Um, I think one of the reasons Morris was really successful as, was because of his humor to help diffuse and even interpret um, difficult, challenging topics. Um, his uh, autobiography, autobiography is called Too Funny to be President, which is something somebody told him when he was running for president in 1976. By the way, Stewart um, was the campaign manager, um, which Maybe one of the many reasons Morris didn't win, but um, uh, they were, yes, they had, they had deep interest. The two brothers had deep interest in conservation and um, environmental protection. They had a competi brotherly competitive relationship, but they were close. Uh, they were close. Good question. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, all right. I'm gonna combine two questions that we have in, into one, basically. Um, so we had somebody ask to tell more about your background, and then someone asked, when did you become interested in Udall? So I think oh, we'll thanks. probably answer those um, together. Thank you. So um, I've, uh, as a, hmm, 
so I was telling you a little bit before the, the program, um, but um, in 2008, I was working uh, as a park ranger at Craters of the Moon National Monument that summer and doing research on Frank Church, who was an Idaho politician um, at Boise State University. I came across a photo of Udall and didn't know who it was. And the archivist said, oh, that's Stuart Udall. He was the interior secretary in the 60s. And I was like, oh. At my next job at a park in El Paso, um, for some reason, I looked up Udall's name and researched him more and learned that he had written a lot of books and was still alive. Um, and so I uh, started purchasing his books and literally I read um, every single one within a few years. The Quiet Crisis um, was one of the books was one of a handful of books that just really, really reached me mentally, um, really spoke to me. And um, I actually reached out to Udall or his uh, social secretary, if you will, to meet him in Santa Fe. Unfortunately, he was uh, deteriorating big time at that point. And so they respectfully denied it. But um, my interest in Udall just grew and grew. And before I started researching and writing the book, I got all these signs that I feel like it was the powers that be that were telling me I must write it. Um, for instance, my ex and I were in a Southern Florida vacation and we stopped in at the Biscayne National Park Visitor Center. We're watching the park film, talking about the establishment of the park and who shows up on that film in black and white footage proposing the park and pushing for it. Stuart Udall. Um, my ex and I are at a play spotlighting the life of Woody Guthrie in Washington, D.C. Who is in the audience randomly? None other than Tom Udall and his wife. <laughs> so I just took these as signs and um, yeah, wrote the book. I think, I think Stuart Udall has a lot of lessons for us today. Um, and he's just really really spoken to me as a human being and writer. Again, he wasn't perfect, but um, one of my idols. Well, that's a great segue, actually. So we have a couple questions, I think, that, that tie into what you just said. Um, did Stewart have any regrets over the Central Arizona project or some of the dam building he was involved in? 100%, absolutely. Um, both Morris and Stewart right. Uh, and they don't, they don't justify it. They say, yep, I was on the wrong side of the aisle. I was, or I was on the wrong side of history. Um, so kudos to them for acknowledging it and not, not defending themselves over it. Um, I will say the issue is not as black and white as we might want to make it. Um, for entrance, for instance, the Central Valley project, which effectively all of uh, Arizona's federal politicians and Stewart as well um, pushed for and created in the late 1960s. Um, that created, gave additional water to Phoenix and Tucson, but dams, hydroelectric dams are non-polluting. The water, my understanding is what the center, where the energy from the Central Valley Project came from to push the water uphill and over to the municipalities was from um, coal-fired power plants. Um, we, of course, know that coal-fired power plants, oil-fired power plants are um, carbon dioxide emitting. Um, so I would argue that it's not black and white, but I will say it's, it's a, we can open up a can of worms with um, pro-dam, anti-dam, but yes uh, is the short answer. Both Stewart and Morris um, acknowledged they were on the wrong side of history in some of the some of the dams. All right um, and here's another interesting question I think a little bit of um, um, you know uh, thinking thinking about um, Stewart uh, in today's world um, this uh, Wayne asked, could he be nominated in today's political environment? If so, do you think he would be as successful as he was? Nominate as nominated as interior secretary or or representative. Um, I guess 
the he would it's become um much more polarized and divisive so nominated to a congressional district i feel like it would unfortunately have to be a urban congressional district like right in tucson or um phoenix um oh interior secretary um yes i i think so i will say that um and you can mark my words on this, uh, there will never be another interior secretary that will serve a full eight years. Um, as we saw with President Obama, Ken Salazar served four years and then, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her name. The, the first female, or no, not the first female secretary, but um, the, the executive of REI. Oh, uh, Sally Jewell served four years. I think politically, um, for political reasons and to get and groom the support from as wide a constituency as possible. Um, it's really, uh, for better or worse, just one term interior uh, secretaries. Um, it doesn't have to be, but that's the de facto rule now. All right. Well, um, but also, like, it, before anyone else leaves, um, some of you have written that you were on Morris or Stewart's uh, staff. By all means, I'd love to communicate with you more. Um, please, anyone, if you're interested, but but especially you all, um, if you can email me, I'd love to love to to chat more. And Scott, if you want, we can include your email address when we, so we always send an email to participants and we send out the, the YouTube, the link to the, to the recording and we can include your email address if you'd like. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, the Udall family is a, a pretty special one. When I did my book tour for this book in late 2018, um, in St. John's, Arizona, their small public, their small library there, no joke, there were about 20 people in the audience and 18 of them had the Udall first name or middle name. Um, but one of them ended up being a distant cousin who showed me around town. Um, and then he put me in touch with Stuart's niece, whom I then stayed with. And she lives next door to, uh, I believe she did pass away. But then uh, in 2018, Stuart's um, sister, which was really neat. So I got to meet her, uh, his, his sister in New Mexico. Um, but a pretty, a, a pretty special family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, we, um, we, there are no more questions and we're right at about time. So I think it's a perfect uh, time to say, um, say thank you, uh, Scott, for your presenting for us today. And this was um, just really fascinating. Um, and I hope everyone goes out and, and buys your book to learn more about Stuart Udall. Um, and so thank you everyone for attending and, and uh, be on the lookout for our next um, program in the biography series. That'll be next, next month. So check on uh, AHS social media or our website if you're interested in joining us for the next program. So, all right, uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your day and, and, uh, and take care.